On the 21st of June 1946, a maid working at the Pembridge Court Hotel, London, was cleaning guest rooms. When she knocked on room number four, she called out to announce that she was there to tidy up, but she received no response. Using the master key, she opened the door and was greeted with an ungodly, gruesome scene. Hello, and welcome to the channel. Inside the room lay the lifeless body of a young woman on a single bed closest to the door. She was naked, covered only by bedsheets up to her neck. She was also tied up by her ankles, with marks on her wrists indicating that she had been tied there also. Her face and body were severely bruised, and 17 lash marks were also found across her body that had a distinctive diamond pattern of that like a woven leather riding crop. Sickeningly, both her nipples had been bitten off, and an object had also been inserted inside of her and forcefully twisted. The maid checked for a pulse, but unsurprisingly was unable to find one. She raced towards the reception and called for help. The woman was quickly identified as being 32-year-old Marjorie Gardner. Marjorie was a mother to a young daughter and had recently separated from her husband, who was abusive and an alcoholic. At the time, Marjorie was living alone in Earl's Court. She was an occasional film extra and trained artist. Her body was examined by forensic pathologist Keith Simpson. Simpson determined Marjorie's death to be between midnight and the early hours of the morning of the 21st of June. He also determined her death to have been caused by suffocation. However, her injuries were sustained while she was still alive. Keith Simpson famously told police, Find that whip, and you found your man. Police, however, had already identified the name of the man they believed to be responsible for Marjorie's killing, Neville George Cleveley Heath. Heath had booked himself a room at the Pembridge Court Hotel on Sunday the 16th of June, but he wasn't alone. Yvonne Simmons, who was only 19 years old, had met Neville Heath the week before in Chelsea and was completely taken aback by his charming good looks. Introducing himself as Lieutenant Colonel Heath, he quickly convinced Devon to agree to marry him and the couple shared a room together before an overjoyed Devon left the following day to travel back to her family home in Worthing. Just a few days later, Heath met Marjorie at a pub in Knightsbridge and the pair instantly clicked. Heath took Marjorie to an exclusive theatre named Club Panama. Witnesses would say that the pair seemed very intoxicated and were seen leaving together after midnight. By now, police had already begun circulating Neville Heath's name in newspapers and his image was circulated throughout the police gazette. His image, though, wasn't made public, something which would later contribute towards his downfall. But by the time police tried to track him down, Heath had already fled, catching a train to Worthing to meet up with Yvonne. Once with Yvonne and her parents, he explained about the murder, only commenting that it had taken place at the same hotel that he was staying at. However, just a few days later, Yvonne would see Heath's name as a person of interest in the murder case. Neville told Yvonne that he was prepared to help in any way he can and so he wrote a letter to Superintendent Tom Barrett to explain his side of the story. I feel it to be my duty to inform you of certain facts in connection with the death of Mrs Gardner. I booked in last Sunday, but not with Mrs Gardner, whom I met for the first time during the week. I had drinks with her on Friday evening, and whilst I was with her, she met an acquaintance with whom she was obliged to sleep. The reasons as I understand them were mainly financial. It was then that Mrs Gardner asked if she could use my hotel room until two o'clock and intimated that I might spend the remainder of the night with her. I gave her my keys. It must have been almost 3am when I returned to the hotel and found her in the condition of which you are aware. I realised that I was in an invidious position and packed my belongings and left. 
Since then, I have been in several minds whether to come forward or not, but in view of the circumstances, I have been afraid to. I can give you a description of the man. He was aged approximately 30, dark haired with a small moustache. His name was Jack, and I gathered he was a friend of Mrs. Gardner of some long standing. I have the instrument with which Mrs. Gardner was beaten, and I'm forwarding this to you today. You will find my fingerprints on it, but you should also find others as well. NGC Heath Heath left Worthing the following day, but not to visit the police, but rather he travelled to Bournemouth and booked himself into the Tollard Royal Hotel, under a pseudonym, Group Captain Rupert Brooke. Ten days later, on the 3rd of July, Heath would meet a woman named Doreen Marshall. At 21 years old, Doreen had served in World War II in the Women's Royal Naval Service. At the time she had been suffering from flu and the measles, and had been discharged from service on the 27th of June, where she travelled to Bournemouth to recover. Her father, Charles Marshall, paid for her room at the Norfolk Hotel, which was one of the few hotels still open to civilians, as many were still being used as billets for British troops at the time. When Doreen met Neville, or Rupert as she knew him, she was quickly impressed by his good looks and mannerisms. She agreed to have afternoon tea with him at the Tollard Royal Hotel where he was staying. Seemingly enjoying his company throughout the afternoon, she accepted his invitation to join him for dinner. Doreen met Rupert later again at the Tollard Royal, where she shared a meal with him, and after, the pair went to the lounge room to listen to music. But by this time, Doreen had become noticeably uncomfortable around Rupert, and she would ask another guest to call a taxi for her. Although Rupert would cancel this, insisting he walk her home instead. Eventually, Doreen reluctantly agreed, and upon leaving, Rupert told the hotel porter that he would be back in half an hour. Doreen, however, quickly quipped, He will only be a quarter of an hour. It was the last time anyone saw Doreen Marshall alive. Two days later, the manager of the Norfolk Hotel that Doreen was staying at grew concerned after realising she hadn't been seen at the hotel since going to dinner with Rupert. Knowing that she went to the Tollard Royal, the manager contacted his respective counterpart there and asked if she was there. The Tollard Royal manager informed him that she had been there on the 3rd, but she hadn't been there since. The manager of the Norfolk Hotel proceeded to contact the police to report Doreen Marshall missing. Meanwhile, the manager at the Tollard Royal, Mr. Ralph, approached Rupert Brooke and asked whether the woman he dined with was in fact Doreen. Rupert denied this, telling Mr. Ralph that the woman he was with on the 3rd was someone else, someone he had known for a long time. Mr. Ralph suggested that Rupert contact the police to clear up the situation, to which he agreed. Brooke contacted Bournemouth Police and spoke with DC George Souter, and after several minutes, Rupert accepted DC Souter's invitation to visit the police station to look at pictures of the missing woman. Heath arrived on the evening of Saturday, the 6th of July, and after looking at the pictures, he confirmed that the woman in the photo was the same person that he shared dinner with. However, he strongly denied any involvement with her disappearance, telling DC Souter that the last time he saw Doreen was when they parted ways in the gardens of central Bournemouth. Souter and another detective strongly suspected that the man they had with them was Neville Heath. They had seen his photo circulating in the police gazette, and DC Souter even joked about the similarity to Charles Marshall and Joan Cruickshanks, Doreen's father and sister, when they met both he and Rupert at the station. However, the hunch they had had become too strong to ignore. Isn't your name Heath? DC Souter asked. Certainly not, Brooke responded. But you look like the picture in the papers, Souter replied. I suppose I do. People have commented on it, Rupert said. But as I mentioned earlier, Heath's image had not been circulated to the public. DC Souter told Rupert to wait, 
and he went to check the image at the police gazette again. And once he had, he was no longer in doubt that the man was Neville Heath. Heath continued to deny the allegations and asked if he could return to his hotel to collect his coat. Officers offered to do this for him, and once they retrieved it, they searched the coat and found a cloakroom ticket for Bournemouth train station and a single pearl that looked as though it came from a necklace. The officer then had an idea. On a hunch, he took the ticket to Bournemouth train station and gave this to a cloakroom attendant. The attendant handed the officer a suitcase. When it was opened, there were clothes inside labelled Heath. Not only this, but inside was also a leather-bound riding crop with the same cross-weave pattern that was found on Marjorie Gardner, as well as a hat and scarf that had blood on them. Armed with this evidence, police in Bournemouth pressed Rupert Brooke and eventually he cracked and told them his real identity. The following day, Neville Heath was transferred to London and was charged with the murder of Marjorie Gardner. It became apparent that Doreen too had likely suffered the same fate. This was sadly confirmed when on the 7th of July, Kathleen Evans was out walking her dog just outside the Bournemouth area. As she walked, she noticed a large gathering of flies surrounding a nearby bush. She told her father about what she saw and he was curious to see for himself. At around 8pm that same evening, the daughter had taken her father to the location of the bush. As they moved closer, they found to their horror the body of a naked woman who was wearing only a single shoe. The woman they found was Doreen Marshall. She had been badly mutilated and had sustained blows to the head. Defensive wounds were also found on her hands showing she had struggled with the blade end of a knife. Like Marjorie Gardner, she too had been tied by the wrists and ankles. One of her nipples had been bitten off and an object had also been forcibly inserted into her. Some of her belongings had also been found, including a pearl necklace with one pearl missing, the same pearl as the one found in Neville Heath's coat pocket. Neville Heath was born on the 6th of June 1917 in Ilford, Essex, to parents William and Bessie Heath. The couple had another child in 1920, but he tragically passed away from tuberculosis while still an infant. It was said that this death had a profound effect on Neville. His father was a barber who made numerous sacrifices to give Neville the best possible start in life. After years of saving, William and Bessie would have another son in 1928, and soon after, Neville was sent to Rutlish Grammar School. Prior to attending grammar school, Neville had committed various petty crimes such as shoplifting. However fearful that their son would hate them, his parents failed to discipline him accordingly. Now at Rutlish Grammar, this soon changed. It was here that he became accustomed to physical punishment for any transgressions that the school deemed worthy of handing out. That being said, Neville Heath was seen by teachers and classmates alike as a charming young man. Neville, however, noticed that the children who attended his school all appeared to come from more affluent families. Wanting to be like them, he began to obsess and fantasize about obtaining wealth and this was an obsession that would stay with him into adulthood. Signs of violent behaviour began to surface as early as age 15, where Neville reportedly attended a party with some friends one night. There, he met a girl and attempted to assault her. Thankfully, the assault was stopped due to her screams alerting other guests at the party. He was subsequently removed from the party, and the next day the girl's father confronted Neville, threatening to notify his school and police. Neville apologised and claimed it to be a misunderstanding, saying that he had too many beers. He told the father that it was only his intention to tease her, and the father amazingly accepted this and agreed not to take the matter further. Heath would eventually fail his exams and after leaving school, he began work at a textile factory. But he continued to aspire to elevate his social status. 
He settled on the idea of joining the military, as the appearance of him in uniform alone would garner a more positive impression by those he would look to impress. He enlisted with the Royal Air Force in 1935, and within a year he was fully qualified. But his desire to be seen as an elite member of society led to him lying to peers about his background and education. It wouldn't be long before Heath began stealing to keep up appearances. However, these crimes would eventually catch up with him and he'd be detained, although he would escape from base and hide with his family, but would be caught soon after. Neville Heath was subsequently court-martialed and dismissed from the RAF in September 1937. Undeterred by this setback, Neville Heath would move to Nottingham shortly after and adopt the identity of Lord Dudley, again to give people the impression he came from wealth. He continued to steal and commit fraud, culminating with him being caught out when he tried to buy an expensive car. But just like when he was 15, he charmed his way out of a harsh sentence, telling a court that he was just a silly young man who had got in over his head. He would move back to London in 1938, but after selling stolen jewellery to a pawnbroker, he was caught and sentenced to three years in prison. The Second World War was in full swing by the time Neville Heath was released. Heath attempted to rejoin the RAF, but was quickly turned away due to his previous behaviour. Instead, he joined the army and was posted to the Middle East. And just like before, Heath lied about his social status and funded his lies through theft and fraud. He would be investigated by the army and they would find a second pay book in his possession and yet again, he was court-martialed and placed on a boat to England to face trial. While travelling to England, the boat stopped at Durban, South Africa. Heath escaped the ship unnoticed and started going by the name James Armstrong. By the end of 1941, Heath was now living a new life, pretending to be a South African-born English race citizen of high class. He successfully applied to join the South African Air Force and became a fiercely well-respected pilot there. He even met a woman, 22-year-old Elizabeth Rivers, who came from a very wealthy family. Seeing Elizabeth as the perfect woman for him, he won her over with his charm and good looks, and within the space of a year, the pair were married. The couple would also have a baby, a boy named Richard Armstrong. Things would take a sour turn when the South African Air Force learned of Armstrong's true identity. Despite this, they would incredibly keep him on as he was able to convince them that he was a changed, reformed man. But this facade wouldn't last as he was accepted back into the RAF after he applied under an alias and he left for England, leaving his son and wife behind. While in the RAF, Neville Heath would earn accolades after saving his crew after his plane crashed due to taking a hit, but he would be dismissed from the RAF again, in part due to his heavy drinking. Neville decided to return to South Africa in 1945, only to learn that his wife had filed for divorce, citing grounds of desertion. He was also court-martialed again after being caught wearing medals that he wasn't entitled to wear. He would eventually return to Britain in early 1946. Living back at home with his parents, Neville had no job and by now was drinking heavily. That didn't stop him from being able to pick up the ladies though. In February 1946, he met a woman named Paula Breeze, who was immediately taken aback by his characteristically good looks and charms. Her impression of him would soon change drastically after waking up to find herself bound and gagged, with Neville standing over her, naked. He proceeded to assault her violently, with Paula's screams being heard throughout the Strand Palace Hotel in London. Heath knocked her out, but fortunately hotel staff intervened and detained Heath. Paula Breeze, however, opted against pressing charges, meaning Neville Heath yet again got away unscathed. In September 1946, the trial of Neville Heath took place at the Old Bailey in London. Crowds of people had gathered outside due to the coverage the case had attracted. 
He was charged with both the murders of Marjorie Gardner and Doreen Marshall, but was only standing trial for killing Marjorie. Although Doreen's murder was used as evidence to confirm his state of mind. Initially, Heath wanted to plead guilty, but his legal counsel, J.D. Caswell, K.C., convinced him otherwise, believing that he could argue successfully that Neville Heath was not guilty by reason of insanity. All right, put me down as not guilty, old boy, Heath reportedly said to Caswell. Caswell's confidence, however, was quickly torn apart after two doctors who examined Heath while in prison testified that while he exhibited psychopathic tendencies, he was by no means insane. It would take a jury just one hour to find Neville Heath guilty, and he was sentenced to death by hanging. On the 16th of October 1946, Neville Heath was led to the gallows. At the time, it was customary for the condemned to be offered a glass of whiskey. He reportedly said while being offered the whiskey, quote, While you're about it, sir, you'd better make it a double. Expressing no remorse for his crimes, Neville Heath was executed a minute before 9am at Pentonville Prison by Britain's chief hangman, Albert Pierpoint. Approximately 20 minutes later, a waxwork model of Neville Heath was erected at Madame Tussauds, which remains in place to this day. There have been some conflicting reports in the years since relating to the relationship with Marjorie Gardner and Neville Heath. It was speculated that Marjorie was into masochism, but this appears not to be the case. It was suggested that she had met Heath before, but it later emerged that Marjorie had in fact been incorrectly identified as the woman who was attacked in February 1946, who we now know was Paula Breeze. At the time of making this video, there is no solid evidence to suggest Marjorie was a masochist. Neville Heath, on the other hand, was most certainly a sadistic, manipulative liar who on many occasions got off lightly for his actions. Based on what I've learned, I don't think it would be a stretch to conclude that he felt a sense of invulnerability. Had he been charged in February 1946, it's very likely both women would have been alive and lived long, fruitful lives. But it's of course easy to say when you have the power of hindsight. I for one think that justice was served, but I'd like to know what you think. Feel free to post a comment sharing your thoughts about this case. I'd be really interested to know what you think. Thank you for watching. If you found this case informative, click the like button. And if you're new here, please consider subscribing to the channel and hitting the notification bell so you never miss an upload. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my channel members, Needle and Fur, The Alabastard, Mr. Gently Benevolent, and Amanda. I greatly appreciate your support. Thank you. Until next time, take care and goodbye. For now.